Welcome everyone. We'll wait a few minutes for everyone to turn up. Whilst we're waiting for everyone to um, come in, there is a form that will be in the chat box that we'd like people to fill in. Um, so if we could do that before the beginning of the session, that'd be fantastic, thank you. Okay, um, I'll just start with the introductions now. Um, there is a form in the chat box that we'd like you to fill in. So if you could do that, that'd be fantastic. Um, welcome everyone um, to our Decolonizing Climate Advocacy Workshop, um, which is organized as part of Weaving Hopes for the Future project. And that's a collaboration between three organizations um, in Malaysia and the UK. Um, I'm Veronica, I'm a final year medical student in the UK and I'm currently involved with Students for Global Health and Moving Hopes. Um, and I'll just run through how today's workshop will run quickly. Um, we'll have a short introduction about the project from uh, Nadia, the coordinator, um, followed by um, the speaker and we'll be discussing how climate ad advocacy um, is colonized and what are the impacts, how we can tackle this and raise the voices of the global south, and as well as how the global north can support this in a healthy manner. Um, and at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions during the session, just pop them in the uh, chat box. We're expecting the session to be around an hour and it is being recorded. Um, so, it, and it will be uploaded onto YouTube. So if you don't want to be shown either your face or your name, um, please turn off your cameras um, and change your name if you if you wish. Um, so without further ado, I'll um, get Nadia to introduce the Weaving Hopes for the Future project now. Hello, hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for making time uh, for friends in the UK. It's uh, slightly after lunch and in Malaysia, uh, it's almost uh, time to sleep but to enjoy, but that's why I'm really thankful that everyone's up making time um, to, to, to come and, and to you know, learn a little bit about what decolonizing climate advocacy means. Okay, um, I think I would like to share my screen um, just a little bit, like some few minutes on uh, what Weaving Hooks is actually. Um, give me a second so I can click present. I hope everyone can see this uh, clearly. Um, any, <laughs> uh, is, it, is it clear? Yeah, oh? yeah. All right, awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. Right, um, so uh, Weaving Hoops. Weaving Hoops is actually a project um, that is um, 
um, being led uh, together by three different groups. We have uh, Grimmies Art Project. Uh, we also have uh, Clima Action Malaysia and also uh, our UK partner, uh, Students for Global Health UK in climate, uh, in climate Change, if I'm not mistaken, the whole name. <laughs> and um, so the project is uh, based on four different pillars uh, on education, activism, creative art and empowerment. It's basically a project to empower Indigenous uh, women and youth. Uh, we want to create the kind of space where they can participate in climate action or in climate decision making locally and, and internationally in a meaningful way. So this is the first step. Uh, this is actually the first ever project uh, of, its, of its kind to increase the participation of Indigenous people in Malaysia on climate change, uh, climate action, sorry. Um, yes, so... Uh, one of the outcomes of the project is that we will um, uh, exhibit, sorry, I keep seeing this video panel screen. All right, we will be exhibiting art installation and creative storytelling co-produced by 11 indigenous women and youth. So basically what they do is through their learning, um, to the workshops that we've been doing together for the past, I don't know, like more than five months already, and they will, uh, for example, one of the groups, they will um, collect and document uh, the kind of impacts uh, of um, climate impacts, how, how it impacts their community. And it's going to be uh, relayed to everyone in the form of uh, creative storytelling. And same goes with the art installation. It's going to be told by, um, it's going to be made by uh, communities uh, in, in uh, uh, the Tamuan communities in Sungai Bulo. Yeah. On. Right. So um, the exhibition tries to eliminate linkages between climate change and land rights. And by this, it will enable a knowledge, uh, enable knowledge exchange in decision making spaces. So these are all the, the photos of faces of uh, our indigenous team. Right. And also, we would like to influence a public perception on indigenous plight how the global community are tied to these struggles and how indigenous empowerment is a key for climate solutions. So this is actually a photo of them in HSKLU. Uh, they, they came uh, for a workshop together with us and uh, we brought them to the village. So they spoke to the uh, villagers. Right, so um, we, are also, uh, are, we are also collecting, uh, raising some funds um, to help on the logistical side of uh, bringing the items to Glasgow. So we are having a target of around 17,000 Malaysian ringgit. If you, um, you know, you would like to show solidarity, please do support this project and, and uh, you know, provide the necessary funds for them to actually, you know, put their voices out there. Uh, in a you know seamless way because right now uh, there are some additional logistical side that we need to figure out due to the uh, pandemic but I, I'm really hoping that we could hit the target right and um, this is also one of the things uh, one of the um, part of the campaign is that we would like people to you know meaningfully participate in this action together with us so if you donate um, minimum a minimum of ten pounds or fifty ringgit, you will get this weaving digital toolkit. So this weaving digital toolkit um, ha is being designed was designed by our indigenous uh, team, and um, as you can see, Veronica here and her friend, uh, she they they both made uh, a tempo, and uh, in the uh, toolkit there is a step by step. Um, uh, a step-by-step -step sort of illustration of how to make this toolkit. So it's really, really interesting. And you would have a chance to, to have your uh, template to be sent to the UK and, and be, um, uh, be presented together with the main exhibition and the art installation itself. So yeah, it's quite cool. And we already have like some few people already trying it out. And so these are some of the things that we want to have it um, where, where the money is going to go to. And um, yeah, your solidarity is absolutely important because we think that weaving is a process of combining, um, connecting you know, one material to the other to form a strong structure. This is not what we think, this is, this is essentially what it meant. But in a way, um, this is what the indigenous girls told us, uh, told us like 
weaving in a sense it, we, it connects all of us and it allows us to reach out to others and build partnerships for a better future so it was a really nice touch a really nice thought from them yeah and currently um, we already managed to get around 7,143 around 60 donors um, so this is where we are we need around you know circa 10,000 Malaysian ringgit that is around a thousand plus uh, uh, pounds and one of our members are uh, <laughs> she's shaving her head off uh, to, to raise funds for this project so it's absolutely crazy but everyone is really you know trying their best to, to support the indigenous uh, women and youth because this is their first ever sort of um, um, you know participation in such spaces so if you need more information, you can always ask me later on after the webinar. You can always ask me. You can go to uh, SFGH, uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Same goes with Klima Asham Lisa and Grimis Art Project as well. So thank you so much uh, for having me and uh, listening to my TED Talk. Uh, I'll just end the uh, screen sharing now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nadia, for that um, great introduction to the project. And I would urge you as the audience to have a look at that link and perhaps donate a few spare um, monies, especially the British the British um, joining on us today because the British fund can go a long way, guys. OK, now I'll quickly introduce the incredible speaker we have today. Um, Dr. Renzo Ginto is um, a physician involved in public and planetary health and um, he's involved with decolonizing um, the field of global health in particular. He served as a consultant to many organizations including the World Health Organization and holds professor and research positions in many universities across the world. He's lectured in nearly 50 countries and published more than 100 art articles and books and produced short films that communicate planetary healing to the world. Um, and after that fantastic um, introduction, I think I'll pass over to you, Dr. Ginto. I can't wait. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Veronica, for that uh, uh, very uh, generous introduction. Uh, and of course, uh, to the organizers, uh, thank you, especially to Amit for his perseverance. He's been writing me for nearly two months already, um, you know, to, to make sure that this uh, session actually um you know uh happens and and of course um you know i i'm i'm grateful uh that even on a saturday night i should uh, be watching netflix now uh but this is so important to uh you know miss and to not tackle uh this this uh challenge of of the climate crisis and how we can uh decolonize it um and so uh, i'm really grateful for this opportunity uh special uh, shout out to, for instance, the Filipinos and the Malaysians, of course, who are actually in the audience. It's already close to 9.30 and they're still wide awake thinking about uh, the climate and the future of our planet. Um, and so, you know, for the next several minutes, uh, we will be uh, talking about, you know, decolonizing climate advocacy. You know, what do we actually mean by that? Um, and, you know, as you, as you can see in this uh, slide, you know, I have several affiliations, Veronica already alluded to it. Um, I have my organization, PH Lab, which tries to really look for uh, and, and create innovations in the area of planetary health. Um, I am the inaugural director of the new planetary and global health program at the St. Luke's Medical Center College of Medicine here in the Philippines. But there's also another hat that uh, I actually want to share with you, especially because we have a Malaysian audience here. Uh, beginning uh, October, I'll be splitting my time between Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur uh, because we are launching a new uh, center for planetary health, the Sunway Center for Planetary Health. It will be hosted by Sunway University, one of the uh, uh, rising uh, universities uh, in Malaysia and in Southeast Asia. I'm actually, um, I tag teamed uh, with uh, Dr. Jamila Mahmood, uh, who just finished her stint as the special advisor to the Malaysian prime minister on public health. So we're joined forces to establish uh, this uh, new center for planetary health with the hope of decolonizing, you know, planetary health and climate research, climate science. We want to put Asia 
um, in the map of uh, planetary health research, education, and practice. So, as you know, I'm from the Philippines, and you know, a country that has experienced not just one, not just two, but multiple uh, layers and, and episodes of colonialism. You know, the Philippines um, was under uh, Spanish rule for 333 years, another 50 years under uh, the American regime. Uh, we had around three years of uh, Japanese uh, imperialism uh, during the time of World War II um, and many other um, empires. Uh, the, I think uh, I remember the British actually uh, spent some time also in the Philippines. There was a hiatus uh, during the Spanish uh, colonization. And, and it, uh, I think for a few years we were under the British rule. And so, you know, colonialism, is, is something not foreign to the Philippines. Um, and and uh, interestingly, this 2021, the Philippines is actually commemorating the 500th year of the arrival of Spain in the Philippines. The first uh, Catholic mass or the Catholic Eucharist, uh, the first time that the, uh, the Spanish uh, conquerors have arrived in the Philippines. So it, it's an interesting year for the country to be you know, remembering this this uh, history, this this past, uh, while we're also tackling uh, a very historic uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, but also bracing ourselves for the long term uh, historic um, you know episode or period of of a more climate unstable future, um, and that's what we're trying to prevent here uh, with um, you know through climate advocacy. Um, I'm sure you've been seeing in social media, you know, this this uh, growing interest around, you know, decolonizing, you know, basically everything, you know, as you can see there, decolonizing humanitarianism, decolonizing education, decolonizing mental health, decolonizing our even our streets, our buildings, you know, uh, look at that statue that was, uh, you know, fell uh, down uh, or uh, you know, scholarships, for example, in, in Oxford uh, that were named after uh, slave uh, owners and, 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 uh, and, and racist uh, historical figures are now being uh, challenged. Even our diets, there's a growing interest in indigenous diets. That's why it's great to hear from Nadia the work of Weaving Hopes in terms of amplifying uh, indigenous voices in the climate, uh, in climate advocacy. So I think right now, you know, every sector, every field, every issue um, is, is really contemplating about this, this question and this concern about, you know, decolonizing. How do you decolonize? What do we do uh, to decolonize? It's, it's really across the board. Um, and and uh, it's, it's just interesting, exciting uh, to see what will happen in the coming years. I think COVID-19 also opened this window uh, for all these sectors to really have this deep, ref deep reflection uh, and interrogate some of our long-standing, you know, quote-unquote coloniality or colonial practices uh, and legacies. Um, I was already introduced a while ago as, as someone from the field of public health. I'm a physician by training. And, you know, for the past several years, I've been deeply involved in this uh, discourse around uh, decolonizing global health. You can see all these articles that have, uh, you know, sprung over the past few years, um, COVID-19 as magnifying the colonial attitudes in global health. So this is a real discussion now in our field, in our, in our sector. And so a lot of the insights that I'll be sharing uh, with you uh, are actually borrowed from this. So I think that's the beauty of, you know, cross-sectoral and cross-disciplinary learning. What are we learning from this decolonizing global health movement that perhaps we can transplant uh, to the growing decolonizing climate advocacy space. And so this is my question. How about in terms of decolonizing climate advocacy? What do we mean by it, right? Is, is climate advocacy even decolonizable? <laughs> um, and, and when we think about decolonizing cl climate advocacy, is it just about amplifying global South voices? I heard a while ago, that you know, one of the objectives of Weaving Hopes is really to, to again, amplify uh, Global South voices and having the Global North uh, allies and, and advocates to be uh, supporters and, and to be, again, critical allies. But, but, but what I will be 
telling you uh, in a short while is it's more than ensuring that there's diversity uh, in the climate advocacy space. And, and they're really uh, deep-seated uh, issues that we need to tackle if we need to decolonize climate advocacy on, on a grand scale. So um, definition of terms, you might be wondering, what do we actually mean by decolonizing? And, an act and actually what's confusing is that decolonize is the verb, right? But there are two nouns that are um, you know, derivatives of that ver verb. So one is decolonization, which is the undoing of colonialism. You know, it's the end of the period of territorial domination of lands. You know, if a, when a conqueror or, or uh, an imperial uh, a country uh, already leaves uh, the uh, colony, then that is the act of decolonization, a largely political and historical process. So, you know, the Philippines has been uh, already decolonized. You know, if again, we use the definition of decolonization, um, more than 50 to 70 years ago, you know, when the Americans, for instance, already left the country. Uh, but the question is, um, yes, the colonization has already happened. The countries have already been liberated from their colonizers. But how about the mentality, the, the culture, you know, the behavior, the language, you know, the, the mental models, the governance structures, um, you know, are, are they also being emancipated? from these colonial legacies. And that's why there's a second term, which is the coloniality or the colonialism. So it's possible that a country has already underwent uh, uh, or undergone the colonization, but there's still so much coloniality in the way society operates. And the colonialism or the coloniality, uh, which has been pioneered by Latin American scholars uh, have been described or has been described as the untangling of the production of knowledge, which is primarily Eurocentric or Western. So it critiques the perceived uh, universality of Western knowledge and the superiority of Western culture. And so there's no doubt that, you know, from our governance structures, the way we discuss these issues, climate change, our, uh, the global media is, is very Western, and also our universities, uh, the research methods that we use to answer some of the pressing questions of our time are all rooted in the Western tradition. It's not saying that the Western tradition is, is wrong and, and inapplicable or inappropriate, but uh, there's no doubt that uh, colonialism has ushered the domination or the, even the hegemony of Western culture, Western science, Western uh, knowledge production systems, and has uh, put, on, or, uh, put on the margins other forms of knowledge production, for instance, some of our knowledge systems here in Asia or in Africa, indigenous knowledge systems, for instance. And then maybe you've heard of this other term, post-colonialism, which is always you know, uh, um, you know, mentioned when we discuss about decolonizing um, you know, a particular sector. But post-colonialism is really interested in what happened after the colonial uh, period, you know, what are the legacies? What are the remnants? Uh, what are the human consequences of exploitation of the colonized people in their lands? And so it's not necessarily, um, you know, uh, attacking or, or, or interrogating or, or even uh, advocating for, um, you know, the uh, untangling of Western knowledge production, production systems, but it's interested more in understanding what happened uh, again, post-liberation uh, or post-colonialism. But obviously, there are strong uh, links and overlaps uh, between the two and even between the three concepts. So I just want to put this out there so that we all know, um, you know what are the differences between these terms. So now, for the next few slides, I will be giving some of my thoughts. So I should have given uh, as a caveat as well that I'm not a decolonial or post-colonial scholar. As, I, as I've said, I'm a physician with a public health background who's advocating adamantly and, and, and passionately uh, for the decolonization of public health, of global health, of planetary health, of the climate, of, of a climate discourse. So, so I'm not a historian, I'm not a, an anthropologist, but there's so much that we can draw from the social sciences if we want to be advocates for the decolonization of climate advocacy. 
So one way, uh, you know, one thing that needs to be de to, to, to decolonize, that needs to be decolonized, is first and foremost, a relationship with the planet. Obviously, and, and I think the simplest way of looking at climate change is it's the most, um, I guess, scandalous manifestation of human colonialism over nature. We've already, we've treated the earth as if uh, it doesn't have planetary boundaries, limits. Um, we've extracted whatever we can. We've not just extracted them, we've burned them, you know, fossil fuels. And then we've emitted a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere um, and, and created this, this mega, not even mega, like, like really a giganta experiment uh, trying to really manipulate um, you know, the climate. And then now we're seeing the consequences of a destabilized climate. Uh, and of course, you know, this behavior, this contemporary behavior of human systems, social systems, the industry, individuals, these are all rooted in activities that have happened way back, you know, before perhaps, um, well, we were already burning coal way, way back, but um, we were also killing animals. We were also uh, destroying uh, natural ecosystems. And so again, this colonial relationship with nature has actually generated this grow, um, you know, existential crisis of our time, which is, which is the climate emergency. We've not only colonized the planet, we've also colonized the future. We've colonized not just the children who are already existing now, we've also colonized those who are yet to be born. Okay? And we've colonized their future, we've colonized their ability to thrive, to survive, to live. And Greta Thunberg will, will, will call it, you know, stealing from their future, right? We know that uh, colonizers have been stealing a lot, you know, from their places that they colonized, from, you know, um, artifacts that they brought to you know, museums like the British Museum uh, in, the U in, in London, uh, all the way to the stealing of, you know, even children, right? Of indigenous children, of, of stealing of culture, stealing of land. And, and we've done the same um, to uh, children, again, of, of the future, their ability to survive uh, and, and to thrive. So as said by that young boy, don't mess with my future. How we can decolonize the future so that uh, our children and our children's children and the children of a hundred years from now will uh, be able to benefit from a living um, earth, you know, and it's uh, life supporting systems. So this might be the, uh, what you might be thinking about, you know, when, when we talk about decolonizing climate advocacy, you might be thinking about, okay, how can we decolonize the movement, the climate movement? So I said here, we colonize the movement. And it's no secret that the climate movement is still very white, still very Western, still very um, even senior, although, you know, thanks to the movement that, you know, Greta and the other Gretas of the world, you know, it's not just Greta, but there are also other young people from other parts of the world. Uh, thanks to their efforts, now we're seeing really uh, the young people stepping up. But largely, you know, the climate movement, the climate discourse, uh, the climate, uh, you know, this discussion apparatus is still very Western, white, um, you know, senior, and even male, right? And so, you know, we need to, um, you know, start really uh, dismantling this, this colonial uh, features of our own movement and to make sure that, uh, you know, more voices are heard, uh, especially the people who, uh, the indigenous communities. The sad thing is we only invite the indigenous uh, representatives during COP to give a speech, right? And sometimes it becomes, or oftentimes even, it becomes more, uh, more of like a tokenism, right? Rather than an actual uh, deep and meaningful and sustained engagement. And so I really appreciate what, again, you know, uh, I've said it many times, what um, your organization is, is doing uh, to amplify indigenous voices. Um, We've not only colonized the, the, the movement, we've also colonized the science. Okay? We've colonized the climate science. There's no, that, there's no doubt climate science improve our understanding of our global climate and its myriad consequences on human health, on society, on ecosystems. But unfortunately, uh, science itself um, is problematic 
one because of its lack of diversity. So you might have heard of the uh, hot list of 1,000 top climate scientists that Reuters launched uh, early this year. And in that list, only five were African, and all of them were white African, uh, were white men who live in Africa. And so that's quite problematic when we know that Africa and Asia and Latin America will be bearing the brunt of the climate crisis and its uh, myriad consequences. But the scientists who are um, supposed to provide the answers, to provide scientific advice to these governments, um, are, 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 are not there or are not recognized and are not included in these um, you know, elite, even colonial, scientific organizations. Um, and of course, the IPCC is the leading climate uh, scientific body. I, I'm pretty sure um, more recently there have been efforts to really you know, increase their diversity in terms of you know, both gender and, and geographic diversity and disciplinary diversity, but certainly more can be done you know, so that we can avoid this, as you can see in this slide, you know, a picture of male uh, IPCC uh, scientists having discussions about the report. Okay. And also, by the way, bef uh, regarding the uh, decolonizing science, we also need to interrogate the research methods and the scientific paradigms that underpin uh, the evidence. And so it will be great in the, if in the future, IPCC and the reports uh, will also uh, capture indigenous systems, indigenous research, uh, especially in the area of, for instance, adaptation. Uh, how can communities adapt uh, to climate change and its myriad uh, impacts um, and, and, and uh, gain more knowledge and, and understanding uh, using indigenous research methods and also those issues confronting indigenous communities and also non-Western communities. I think we've also colonized the negotiations. Okay? We've colonized the negotiations in myriad ways. We know that at the end of the day, uh, in COP26, COP25, COP all these COPs, it's the big countries that are really um, uh, steering the direction of the discussions. I remember in COP15, that picture that you can see, COP15 in Copenhagen, there was even a closed door meeting between the rich countries and China, and all the rest of the countries were left out of the discussions. And then they just came out of the, the room and they announced there's already a, a Copenhagen, um, you know, communique, something like that. And, and, you know, the Climate Vulnerable Forum, for instance, which is the uh, group of all the most uh, vulnerable countries in the world, were not even given um, the opportunity to, to contribute. And of course, I'm sure that's not an isolated case. That has been happening throughout the past 25 COPs, right? And so, you know, we need to start also questioning, you know, the diversity and, and representation and meaningful participation of, uh, you know, marginalized groups of poorer countries in the negotiations, because that is important to make sure that the outputs, the outcomes of the negotiations are truly, uh, you know, universally acceptable and uh, responsive to the needs, not of some people, but of all. So for instance, as we know, we, don't, we still don't have uh, strong international legal instruments for uh, climate-induced migration, climate migrants. And of course, the big countries will not really think about it, at least not yet, because they might be thinking this is more of an issue for the Pacific Islands and the poorer countries that will be suffering from sea level rise and other extreme weather events. And so we need to make sure that you know, there's representation, meaningful, equal, and inclusive representation, so that the issues confronted by the different communities of the world are also reflected in the outputs, the outcomes of the negotiation. I think we also colonize the solutions. Right now, uh, our solution to climate change is to adopt low carbon technologies, whether in terms of energy, transport, okay? let us call for uh, the reduction of meat consumption, even if we know that there are significant parts of the world 
who are poor and undernourished and do not even ac have access to adequate amounts of, of meat, while other places are over-consuming meat. Okay? And um, you know, we're, we're introducing and we're um, uh, promoting, you know, again, green technologies, uh, calling for more technology transfer, transfer from rich to poor countries without really tackling the roots of the climate crisis, which is overconsumption, unsustainable consumption, and also making sure that our prescriptions or solutions are equitable, meaning considering um, you know, the, the demands and the needs, especially of the poor countries. Um, and so I can see a lot of greenwashing here. The big transnational corporations are also uh, using um, you know, the climate crisis to uh, enhance their um, you know, credibility and their image without real uh, and, uh, and substantial and lasting changes, for example, in the political economy that underpins the climate crisis. So we're all focusing on the uh, symptoms and not on the uh, true etiology or the root cause of disease. And we're also resorting to, let's say, you know, the, the cures and, and the short-term cures rather than coming up with what I would call the planetary vaccine, which is the redesign and the reorientation of the global economy to make it emit less uh, and adapt more. And finally, I think we colonize the victims. They're already victims of the climate crisis and we're making it much more difficult for them to adapt to uh, the changing times, to the myriad effects of climate change. So as you can see, this is an old uh, map from the WHO. The top map shows to you the parts of the world that have, have emitted the greatest amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, North America, Europe, and more recently China uh, as, as a major emitter. But at the bottom, you will see um, being magnified the parts of the world that will be bearing the brunt of climate change and its health, agriculture, and, and other social consequences. So that's Africa, you know, South Asia. And I always say that the Pacific Islands are probably, um, you know, are, are too small to be magnified, maybe because they're too small, but also per probably by 2030, unfortunately, these countries might have been erased already from the face of the earth because of sea level rise. And so there's really a huge uh, inequality and injustice here. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the leading emitters uh, continue to um, you know, uh, operate uh, on a business as usual uh, mode. And the countries that will be suffering the most from climate change are uh, you know, not really benefiting, for instance, from you know, the existing climate financing, uh, you know, the, the legal instruments, et cetera. And so I think this is another form of colonialism when we are, again, um, making the victims become even, you know, you know, more serious victims as a result of our failed uh, policies and actions. So this is another uh, graph from our world in data showing to you that, you know, a lot of the countries that have emitted the least amount of greenhouse gases are also poorer countries, countries with energy poverty, countries with weak health systems, countries with very limited adaptive capacity to address the climate crisis. And these are all old colonies as well. And so it's, it's multiple layers of, of vulnerability, of disadvantage, and, and we're not really tackling you know, that uh, aspect. And instead, as I've said, we're focusing on you know, the icing and not the, the chiffon of the cake itself. So I'm reaching the end of my talk and, and in my next slides will be more of um, uh, key messages and, and reminders. So, so one, I, this is an interesting diagram from uh, Dr. Rupa Maria from the University of California, San Francisco. And basically, she's saying that all these isms, these problems that we're seeing, you know, and these different forms of supremacy, white supremacy, which leads to racism and, and slavery and genocide, you know, male supremacy, 
in other words patriarchy which has which leads to you know uh sexual discrimination you know uh discrimination against women and the lgbt and 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 other uh non-conforming uh uh you know ident gender identities and the human supremacy human of, of humanity over nature which he called ecocide here all of these are rooted in this uh legacy of, of colon colonization of colonialism and it has very close ties and linkages with capitalism as perhaps the modern day apparatus for uh, the perpetuation of these colonial legacies and so we need to start looking at all these connected issues and not you know in a siloed approach okay and we need to also um uh, you know and in relation to the previous slide we need to tackle uh the existing power asymmetries and the privileges uh that some enjoy and most people don't have okay i would like to remind everyone that we are in a very privileged space of zoom not everybody can have a conversation about these very important issues um you know many people don't even have wi-fi to gain access to zoom and so with great power and privilege there we, there's there's really an, an uh, utmost uh, responsibility and obligation to tackle all of these uh you know barriers to you know equality and and justice um and 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 uh to, to the true decolonization of of our society including the uh, our climate uh, movement the climate advocacy uh sector so words of caution of course we all want to decolonize we are going to do every uh, um, thing that we can you know contribute but we need to also make sure that in our pursuit to decolonize we don't end up becoming neo colonizers ourselves okay because um you know uh you might easily get excited we can easily get excited let's change the world but you know uh, as a consequence we are actually uh contributing to the exacerbation of the problems and so we need to be constantly reflexive about our position our privilege also our disadvantages we need to be able to understand our personal and societal histories we also need moral courage here it's not easy to be a decolonizer and to shape to, to be the one who is always seen as disruptive although you know climate advocates climate uh, um, activists are uh, are always seen as that you know i've been to cop 21 in paris and protesters are are, are being um, you know um uh, even harmed you know uh uh if 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 things become more serious but but beyond the physical it requires some form of moral courage to be a decolonizer and to decolonize the climate movement and of course we do this with a sense of mission as i've said a while ago with great power and privilege comes responsibility with opportunity comes obligation so we are you know we're this is a conversation that we're having in in the field of global health i think we should also adopt this in the climate advocacy realm that you know in our pursuit of the colonizing um again we don't end up becoming neo colonizers and it's not just it shouldn't be superficial you know that it's you know we're just showing or proving our our wokeness what we really want is uh, a true dismantling of these power structures uh that are perpetuating for example the discourse around the climate the types of climate solutions that are being uh propagated the, the nature of our negotiations the diversity of our movement and our science all of these uh will need to be uh changed and and to decolonize and that's why we need to go beyond the cosmetic okay it's not enough that you know we have you know more people of color for example in a committee or more asian and african sounding names as part of a petition we need to make sure that they go beyond you know the tip of the iceberg literally and and really tackle again the underlying structures and the mental models you know what are the mental models that we have in our mind when we deal with issues related to the climate and that's why um and and this is just to introduce a, a new concept uh that came from the health sector you know planetary health is is uh, a powerful concept that that 
I've been advocating for, that I embraced since the time I, I learned about it. And in planetary health, we don't have any more just one patient, which is the people. We also have another patient, which is the planet. And planetary health emphasizes this importance of you know, the pluriversality of knowledge. It's not just universality of Western knowledge. It's the pluriversality, meaning there's so many different knowledge systems where that, that, that can enrich you know, the discourse and also that can help us incubate uh, more lasting and more uh, durable solutions. Um, planetary health also helps us decolonize our relationship with Mother Earth. So I think it's a shift from an ecological perspective. You know, we are at the top of the pyramid of nature. We are here to extract, to mine, to consume, to harvest. And we can do that to our heart's desire as if there are no limits and without utmost respect for all creatures, great and small. So we need to stop this kind of mentality and instead shift to a more ecological approach that is truly holistic, sustainable, you know, in harmony and solidarity uh, with Mother Earth and its other inhabitants and also uh, its uh, life-supporting systems. I already implied on this a while ago, we can't be um, focusing or, or being um, uh, or settling you know, with the stopgap measures and solutions. Oh, let's introduce these green technologies. But truly, we need to renovate or even decolonize the political economy of planetary health. This idea that we can consume endlessly, produce limitlessly, pollute um, you know, endlessly as well, you know, that has to stop. And instead, we need to shift to another economic mindset and model that safeguards the health of people and the health of the planet as well. And you might be familiar with that uh, diagram. That's a donut economy that was uh, proposed by uh, Kate Rayworth, uh, a British economist. Finally, I think, you know, um, as part of our decolonizing, uh, not just climate advocacy, but but the climate and decolonizing our relationship with the earth. I, a while ago, I also said it's about decolonizing our future, right? Or decolonizing the future or making sure we don't colonize the future and the ability of our future children to live and thrive. This book is, is, is what, what it's about, you know, or, or what it's trying to say. Um, this book, The Good Ancestor, very new book, it's uh, a call to uh, graduate from short-termism and instead shift towards a more long-term thinking, futures thinking approach. Basically what it's saying is that what we want is the future children of 2121, which is a hundred years from now. We look back to the past, we'll read, we'll read the history books and they will say that the COVID generation of 2021, and that is us, the generation who went to COP26, we're good ancestors to them because we've made the right decisions, not just for ourselves, but also for their health and well-being as well. So I think that is another way to really decolonize uh, our future, our relationship with future generations, to become good ancestors to them and making decisions that don't only benefit us in the in the short term, uh, in the present, but also benefiting people who will be living hundreds of years from now. So what can we do? Just summarizing what I already mentioned, routine self-reflection. We need to claim our space, but we need to also share our space with others. We need to Critically analyze. There has to be critical discourse. It can't just be superficial, um, you know, for example, promotion of the green technologies, but, you know, interrogating the economic uh, principles underlying uh, these um, activities. Listen to new alternative voices. Okay? Listen to voices from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, indigenous voices, women voices voices from the people, uh, groups of, of people with disabilities and all the other groups that have been margin, uh, marginalized for 
for for for a long time build global alliances so i'm really glad that this event is co-organized between the young people of the uk and of of malaysia and we need more uh young people or young people's organizations from different parts of the world to come together. And I'm very aware that we actually have a very vibrant young go uh, and, and you know, youth networks uh, in, in the climate space. We need to build a culture of mentorship as well. So we can learn from our seniors and we all can also learn from each other and, and find a mentor, be a mentor. And ultimately we need to tackle the systemic roots of uh, the coloniality of, of our society, you know, not and uh, which which led to the colonial features of the climate, of global health, of science, of global governance, etc. So yeah, because we owe it not just to ourselves, not and but to these children. You know, I keep on emphasizing that we have an obligation to the future generations, and we need to stop colonizing their future, and instead. Um, making sure that we leave behind to them a healthy earth so that they can also live uh, and thrive healthily as well in the future. So together, let's advance the health of both people and planet. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Ginto. I think um, I speak for everyone when I say that was really great and uh, insightful. Um, we'll take some uh questions now so if you'd like to put anything in the chat box or message me or i meet privately but don't run off just yet because i have a few comments at the end um uh, i have a question as well that i thought of um if you could answer um i was just wondering with cop 26 being a very big um event coming up it's been you know a couple of years since the last one and it's in the uk um how can we decolonize COP26 um, both, um, you know, systemically and as individuals? Great question. And, you know, we only have a few months remaining to think about it and to plan for it. No, I wish, I wish we, we, we had this conversation last year when, you know, COP26 was already postponed uh, for, a, you know, for a year. So, you know, we, we missed some time, but it's never too late. Um, and, and also, we need to acknowledge that this year's COP is actually happening in the UK, okay, um, which is quite uh, well. One, you know, it, it's 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 a colonial power before it is still a major, uh, you know, neo-colonial power, you know, in this day and age. Uh, and also, the pandemic is making it much more difficult for young people for ordinary people to actually go to the UK, for example, and participate even outside, you know, that's the other thing. The whole COP in itself is not necessarily accessible to everyone because, you know, access to the main negotiating table is only limited to key people representing governments. Unfortunately, there are some private actors that are that have the ability to influence the negotiations, even if they don't have the legitimacy of people, uh, because you know they're not voted, they're not governments. So how can we decolonize this upcoming COP and the future COPs? Okay, I think one, um, you know, we need to um, one we one one space that we need to take advantage of is the digital space. Okay. Um, I don't know if there are plans to organize a, a kind of a digital parallel COP of the people, right? I think that will be a great idea. And we can have the involvement of as many people as we want, even, even millions of people to participate and come up with, you know, uh, our own Paris rule book, <laughs> because I know that is one of the key outputs of, of the upcoming COP. That it, a Paris rule book that is written by the people and for the people. Okay. So I don't know if we have time to come up with something like that, to, to galvanize some, with, uh, something like that. But, you know, for the future COPs, uh, now that we, we, we have the digital space, we should, uh, you know, think creatively and come up with these new kinds of engagement uh, that are more inclusive. Uh, and and uh, you know more more representative. 
I think we need to, um, and I'm sure the climate movement is already doing that, and and we need more of this. You, you know, really um, um, uh, you know, questioning uh, the, the 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 framing, the key messaging of you know COP26 of the outcomes or the expected outputs and outcomes, the messaging, for example, that is uh, uh, being um, uh, propagated now by, for example, the host country, the UK. Uh, and then we can do that, sure, in the, in the digital platform, we should be writing about, you know, our, our sentiments, we should be, um, uh, you know, writing letters to our leaders and 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 also uh saturating the digital space twitter with with all these kinds of really progressive messages again we already have them even from before and maybe we need to really um, um kind of um uh boost uh the advocacy even more so at least those are some of my two questions uh obviously it's a hard question but um um I guess we need to also uh, set an example because unfortunately COP is, is not going to change overnight. But the climate movement, if it wants to, can, because we're more fluid, we're more adaptive, uh, we're more inclusive. And so if we can show how, you know, um, a decolonized climate discourse, a, a decolonized climate negotiation can happen then we will be able to set a role model uh, or be the, a role model, set an example for those who will be congregating inside the uh, air-conditioned uh, hall uh, in Glasgow. I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Um, there's a couple more questions coming through the chat. And um, Claudia, thank you for sharing COI16, um, which is like a COP organized by youth. Thank you. Um, next question. Can you give an example of a good intention exacerbating the problem? And how do we really be sure what we do is in the right direction rather than being futile? Yep. So um, I think, you know, when, when people, people, governments, corporates, when they say, oh, we will uh, introduce uh, and, and share, you know, green technologies uh, to, um, you know, uh, developing countries, for example, I think um, the intention is good. We want to transfer technology. We want to support them. So uh, poor, poorer countries to be able to lower their emissions, mitigate or adapt, you know, if, if that's an adaptive solution. But we know that if we keep on doing it without really changing the rules of the game, the climate crisis will continue to, to worsen the industries will continue to emit gases. And again, because we did not uh, really tackle the, the root cause. And so, so that's, I think, one example of, you know, you have good intentions, you have great suggestions and, and prescriptions and, and even uh, some initial support. But if the, um, the apparatus itself uh, does not change, then later on, we'll see the same problems emerging again. And Again, we will look for another new technology as a solution, but we did not really change uh, the root cause, which is the defective economic system that we have that uh, favors overconsumption and overproduction and greenhouse gas emissions and inequality and you know the already rich enriching themselves even further. Um, and so, if we don't tackle those more systematic issues, then you know, uh, our good intentions will be futile, right? Because we'll not be able to solve the problem uh, ultimately. Um, another example is, you know, for example, in the climate movement, everyone wants to help uh, advocate for the climate. Everyone wants to have a space, uh, a seat around the table, have access to the microphone. But maybe we're not thinking about who, uh, who's, who, who else uh, would want to have a seat around the table, but maybe does not have a seat anymore to occupy because we already occupied it? Who else has a voice and has a story that needs to be heard by the world, but because the microphone 
or the or the pen or well no one writes anymore they're all, they all type right so you know the the, the digital platform is is beyond uh, their their reach you know it's not accessible to them they're not able to amplify their voices and share their stories and so so that's another example and and i hope that again that's why it's important to acknowledge your privilege who is not in this room who should be engaged in these conversations maybe that's our homework to find those people and make sure that we are able to provide them the space and the microphone to tell their stories and their demands i'll stop there all right thank you um i have a few more questions but sure before that if anyone needs to leave it has been an hour thank you for don't all leave your yet time. Um, <laughs> we kidding. can we can um a few more uh important things for me and then we can do the rest of the questions if that's okay mm -hmm. um firstly if you haven't filled in the participation form please do so now it's really important for us and um we also since you've donated your time to us uh, today um quickly take a picture of everything uh, of everyone um of this session if that's okay uh that would be really fantastic and useful for us um and if you're leaving now, uh, thank you for joining us. This will be uploaded onto YouTube and please have a look at that donation link as well. All right, um, Amit, will you be taking the screenshot? Yep, definitely. I'll just stop the recording now and then we'll take the screenshot.